Hi, Isabella. Thanks so much for joining me, friend. You're welcome. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. I've been very much looking forward to this. Uh, as I joked a few weeks ago, I, I feel like whenever I see your tweets, I just hit like immediately before I've even finished reading them because I'm like, oh, this is good. And uh, <laughs> felt like a conversation wanted to happen. And uh, yeah, there's just so much, so much wisdom pouring out of the things that you write and things that have already really touched me very deeply and uh, would love to, yeah, just learn more about you and your story and and kind of where this wisdom is coming from in your life. And um, yeah, that's part of why um, in this show that's happened karmically in my life, I tend to start by asking people about their life story. I really find that um, in particular, the details of people's lives and the story and, and how they think about their lives and how they talk about their lives shapes whatever it is that I'm interested in learning from them and how I think about it and really provides context for that. So I love to dive into that stuff. And I really noticed as well, like in reading through your tweets and your writing before the conversation, like uh, at least for me as a reader, that feels like a big lacuna in in your writing of like, just, I want to know more about you and your life and your story. And, you know, I heard a few things here and there that you sort of alluded to, but I, I'm I'm hungry for that kind of information and connecting the dots between that and the specifics that you say. So I hope we'll get into some of that and uh, yeah, just really happy to have you. So um, yeah, with that, would love to ask you about your life story and feel free to answer in any way that you want to at any length that you want to short or long, would love to hear anything that you had to share. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for those kind words. And I'm excited to chat about everything from, you know, recent ideas to, I guess, like the earliest context of my life. And I, it's funny thinking about how I tell my life story, like over the years, in general, I feel like the, the theme is I feel very blessed. And I feel like I've had the ability to develop like self-awareness and self-knowledge like at a pretty young age and not through any kind of like dramatic or traumatic catalyst event I just actually think that that was like my nature very young um and it's funny because I think we a lot of us like wonder where our personality comes from right like nature nurture life events environment and I think a lot of that still remains a mystery but at least my parents tell me that like I was pretty focused and like driven and like self-driven like very, very early. And I always thought that was interesting because a lot of the people that I connect with, like at least in the, I don't know, the later years, like of early adulthood, um, seem to have felt like very pressured to succeed and like become this person that was like high achieving and like did all these things. And I don't know. I think I could like paint a narrative like that in hindsight, but I actually don't think that that's true. Like, I think I was always just a very driven kid. So I guess like winding it all the way back, I was a focus, like driven, kind of like good in school, um, like naturally sort of disciplined child. I did competitive gymnastics, which was like definitely a huge part of that from like very young, like six. Um, and yeah, I just kind of was like really good at doing what I needed to do and like studying, doing well in school, doing well in athletics. Um, and I think that just kind of like bred a bit of like a high achieving, high performing engine in me where I seemed to kind of like gravitate to what I considered like hard things at the time. So when I was like picking my school, like courses in high school, it was like, oh, I'm just like gonna do math and science and like these hard courses because I can do well in them. And so like, why not? And then that trend kind of just like kept going for a while where I was like, oh, now I have to pick my program. Like, I guess I'm going to pick engineering because like that seems to be a hard thing that like opens doors. Like a lot of these kind of like overarching umbrella terms that like I didn't really have a great understanding of at the time, but like seemed to be the things that I should be aiming at. Hard things, open doors, optionality, et cetera. So uh, I followed that path of just like doing well in school, doing well at um, working hard, like doing well at the things that I was pursuing at the time. I was like working and just like always liked to have a lot of my plate. There was like kind of a theme of like high performance and busyness, I think when I was young. 
and yeah, chasing like the hardest thing that I could. And so as a result of like those few forces together, I actually don't think I had a great grasp on my interests when I was young. Like if you asked me which courses I was interested in or what subjects I was interested in, I couldn't really answer. Like I had like more or less the same marks across the board and I didn't have a lot of like free time. So I don't know. It wasn't like my parents were like pulling me away from like my paintbrush to like force me to do homework. Like that just wasn't my dynamic. Um, and so I think I only kind of like woke up or like became very conscious to my interests halfway through my engineering degree where I realized I probably didn't want to do this in the long term. Like I didn't want to do engineering. I just felt like it was very technical. I didn't have like any electives at the time. And I was kind of like, cre like craving like a creative outlet. And I was creative when I was younger, but, and I actually like loved art classes, but I just like never even thought to like pay attention to that because again, I felt like I could do science. I should do science. Um, and then, yeah, halfway through my engineering degree, I was like, I really need like a creative outlet because all I do are these like technical courses all day. And I, I, I kind of am interested in other things. And then I started writing um, kind of just like, blog sort of style essays sort of similar to what I do now but like much more diluted I would say and like personal just kind of like me making sense of like finding my path when I was like 17. Um, I will also say that from a pretty young age like probably late middle school early high school I started journaling religiously and that became like a kind of just practice that I kept up for I guess like the following 10 years like I never really stopped journaling which is why I also think I developed this like kind of self-awareness which uh I seemed to like have access to earlier than other people I just think like not a lot kind of went by me in my life like that I didn't process so that was like a sort of natural good fortune that I was interested in journaling because I think it yeah it resulted in like a pretty good grasp of my personality when I was as I was maturing. But anyway, I, I had like a moment during my engineering degree where I really, really viscerally felt like this is the wrong thing. And I should be studying like psychology or philosophy or some combination of other more mind focused, humanity focused um, subjects. But I was pretty close to the end of my degree at that point and kind of just like made peace with the fact that I wanted to Kind of just finish it and also that I was probably going to do better learning about the things I was interested in like in the, in the way that I was interested in them rather than kind of restarting an entire degree um so that was like kind of my story till then then after that I actually spent a summer in Singapore um right before I graduated and that was like kind of my awakening summer I would say where I just like read a bunch of books about like at a high level individuality and like self-actualization, but I couldn't have like said that that was the theme I was interested in at the time. It just kind of like kept tumbling into these different books I was grabbing. And then I kind of came home and I was like, I'm probably just going to graduate without a job and like figure it out because I'm not interested in like banking and consulting, which is what all my friends were recruiting for at the time. Um, and then kind of just an opportunity sort of fell in my lap and that was in venture capital which was like a nice meeting of my interests, I felt like, um, kind of like interpersonal, some elements of creative, and then also like quantitative technical stuff, which I really felt like deeply that I needed to do quantitative, technical, science-y, some sort of numerical thing in my life to have like balance. Like I didn't think, I didn't ever consider that like being purely creative or artistic was like at all an option. Um, Anyway, then I, so I did that job and about two years into that, I left to do writing, which was kind of like, um, yeah, a pretty unexpected decision, I would say from like the outside looking at my path. But for me, it actually kind of makes a lot of sense, like in hindsight, because I think like, I see this theme like running through all of the times I was like trying to be this thing that was like technical and quantitative and like high achieving and the way that I thought that that word meant I was sort of like on the inside 
pulled to this like other thing that I would try and like stuff into the like crevices that were left with my time when I wasn't doing that thing that I thought I should be doing. And that was writing. That was like creativity. But yeah, I just like never really took it seriously until I got to a point where I was like, actually, this is kind of like all I want to do. And I'm starting to realize like if my dream is to sit in coffee shops and write and like somehow make this my my life's thing then I kind of need to be like on a path that's actually tracking there and I felt like I was on the opposite of that like I saw no way in which my path was going to take me there if I just like let it ride and so it was a combination of being like I should actually kind of like try out a smaller version of this dream life to like make sure it's actually what I want and if I want it I should just like go out and take it like right now because no one's going to give it to me and there's kind of just like no other way. Well, I, there are plenty of other ways, I'm sure. But like, in my view, I was so tired of like splitting my time between six other things, which I had to do because my identity was fractionalized across like quantitative, technical, creative, writing, art, like all of these things. I was trying to be everything. And then I realized like, okay, much stronger pull to one of these like five things that I'm doing. So I should just go all in and like see what my energy like see what it looks like to put 100% of my energy onto one thing. And yeah, that kind of manifested in me taking my writing more seriously, taking like basically starting Twitter and yeah, sharing kind of like my thoughts. So that's the story I would say. Mm. Beautiful, beautiful. I loved hearing that. Thank you. Um, I'd love to start by asking you about gymnastics because that's not an experience I had as a child and I would just love to know like can you paint a picture of what that was like for you as a six-year-old girl and like what mm -hmm. what that meant to you and uh yeah help me help me understand what that might be like since I didn't have that experience yeah uh it was pretty intense actually like when I was yeah five or six like I started in this like competitive group in gymnastics which was basically like you're selected for if you're just like sufficiently flexible at five or six years old um, as the early marker, which I guess I was. And you're put into like a pretty intensive training regimen. Like I think we were training 16 hours a week when I was like, yeah, that young, oh. um, like four days a week, four hours each time. And that stayed pretty consistent. I think we got to like 20, 25 hours by the time I was like 15 or 16. So I guess it like scaled up over time, but I was, I kind of just grew up like training four days a week. Like that was just my life. I revolved my life around having to get my work done in between that. So I kind of had a very good relationship with like scheduling and time management because of that. Um, just because like you could not miss a training day because you were behind on school. Like that was just not something that happened. Um, and I also was like not getting like breaks in school because of it nor did I expect to so it just like forced me to be really good with time and then although probably that skill has deteriorated since I left gymnastics a little bit um but yeah I think it was like very intense I remember <laughs> I have some like vivid memories of being like pushed pretty hard when I was six which I think I like I took my foot off the gas a little bit for like a couple years probably around like six to eight because um it was very intense environment but then I just like went back to it because I, I think I actually really liked that and like how it actually breaks down is you're in this like group of you know somewhere between like five and 12 other girls or like your age or kind of level and you spend all this time together like I would spend more time at the gym than I would at home a lot of weeks and you become like family with these people your coaches are like such important kind of parental almost figures in your life and I think like the key things that I always talk about learning from gymnastics were like discipline and you know like personal responsibility like you're just so 100% responsible for your results and like your progress and there's just it's such an individual sport like there's just no no way around that and um yeah, the time management was really big. And then like the strength slash like facing your fears is like a huge thing. Like you literally just need to do things you're scared of every single day, which I think was probably like a very healthy muscle to train when I was young. And I think, you know, if I have to look at like the shadow of it, I would say that 
the level of mental toughness that I developed really young through that sport was very helpful in like muscling through kind of everything that I needed to do to succeed at that age. Like really, it, it almost didn't feel hard for me because I was just so used to like doing uncomfortable and challenging things. But I think like it possibly contributed to this like numbing of interests I talked about um, when I was describing my story. Like, I think you're just like not allowed to feel on some level. Like you crying was not a thing. Like you're, you really just like need to be tough and it's actually a very masculine sport, like on the way we think about feminine masculine energy, like obviously it's a beautiful, elegant sport when you're looking at it, but what goes into it is very um, hard execution, discipline, no emotion, no softness. Like it's not a very like n nurturing place exactly. Um, so I think that like put me in my masculine very young. And I think that theme like really carried through to honestly, like probably almost as like recently as in the last year, I would say I have like come more into my feminine, but I think, yeah, I was just like trained very young to be kind of stoic and like focused. And that makes you like a very good kid. And I don't regret any of it, but I think it like numbed me a bit to some of those like very feeling I'm interested in this. I love the, the way this feels kinds of experiences. Um, but I feel very blessed to have had my gymnastics experience and on like a physical level, it really just like primes you to do every other kind of physical pursuit you'd ever want to do um, from a flexibility and strength perspective. Like you just have so much physical body awareness from like training that much and like doing those kinds of skills uh, that I'm extremely grateful for. So hmm. that's kind of like gymnastics at a high level. <laughs> when did you stop doing gymnastics? About midway through high school, I think I was 16, 15. I think did, I was 15. Did you decide um, to stop or is it something that ends, like a program that ends or? It was kind of a combination of things. I broke my ankle pretty badly when I was 14. Uh, I fell off balance beam at a competition and broke my ankle in like three places. And hmm. it was quite messy, like surgery screws the whole bit, which was another like you know bug that turned into a feature kind of thing like that was such a transformative experience being injured like being grateful for my mobility and really appreciating like how fortunate I was and am to like have a body that moves as I want it to um and healing from that was very powerful and returning to gymnastics which I did like I went to training every day still and like kept my skills um, sorry, like didn't keep my skills, but I, that made it easier to get back my skills. But I think like as, as, at a certain age, like your body's just kind of a little bit done with it um, in the sense that it's like easier to get injured. Things hurt more. You're not as like, I don't know, bouncy. Like you're not as just like young, basically. Like gymnastics is made for very like tiny little bouncy people. Um, so it was some of those things, but it was also just kind of like moving to the next stages of my life I guess like I was starting to get ready to focus on you know like submitting marks university and it just kind of was like a made a time where like a lot of people stop and like made sense to stop and then I did like get a job after I stopped because I was like oh I actually I need to be this busy which is also another funny reflection looking back um which was another incredible experience. So it was kind of like a mixture of things and sort of like getting close to like my expiry date in the sport anyway, um, wanting to shift my focus and then that giving space for more experiences, which ended up being extremely constructive. So, yeah. Hmm. What was the job that you got then? Um, I kind of was like working at a bunch of different retail stores over the next two years, not a bunch, but like I would have told me Hilfiger in the mall near my house, which I actually loved mm. because, um, I mean, like, I think sales jobs are like retail sales. It's just like kind of a formative experience. And if you can get your hands on one when you're young, like, it's just a great, you should do it. Um, I got to like meet and integrate with people that I had never that were a lot older than me that had very different lives than I was like growing up with and around. Um, 
And I thought that was super interesting. Like it almost felt like this like cool, mature thing that I could do uh, like right after I turned 16. And then uh, after Tommy Hilfiger, I worked at um, Purdy's, a chocolate place in Toronto. It's like mm. a chocolatier place in Canada, which was like the best job ever. Um, you're literally just like giving people chocolate all day and like they encourage you to like eat the chocolate every day. So mm kind of like ideal work environment <laughs> but yeah I actually just really liked like services and like working with people and like again I liked the busy like balanced schedule so those were really good jobs I think for me to have at that age hmm. fascinating I love to hear that uh I wonder about you said that mm, when you're deciding what job to do coming out of school like you were like oh I have to have something that has this like quantitative aspect to it and I wonder if you feel that way now about your life like you're a full-time writer you're making this your livelihood but like is, is that a value that you still hold about your life or is does that quantitative aspect come out now in any way so I think it is an identity thing that I needed to let go of like I think it was just like this thing that I had told myself I was and I didn't realize that for a while, like it, it had become so part of the dialogue in my own head about myself that I didn't realize it was like actually something I could just like pluck out and like not have and let go of. Mm. Um, so at a certain point, I guess either someone said it to me or like I figured it out that it was like, is that true? Or like, is that something I just like have gotten so used to saying that I don't question it anymore? Like this, I need to balance quantitative and creative. I need to be like technical and, you know, interpersonal or whatever hmm. uh and so eventually I was like I actually am starting to think maybe that's not true and like that's just what I thought was valuable and so therefore I like always needed to keep like a slice of my energy pie for this thing that is valuable otherwise like what am I you know like am hmm. I just not valuable if I can't do this thing that I think is inherently the most valuable so uh, I would say I've like let go of the notion that I need to split my time between anything. I actually think that that was probably a broken notion in hindsight. And um, and like, we're just more powerful when we're, we're focused on something like to our fullest. Well, maybe that's not true for everyone, but like that, I do feel that that is true for me. And I never even got to experiment with that because I was always so divided between things. Uh, again, to optimize for this like multifaceted identity, which I can only say in hindsight, but like, I do think that, that's what was going on there. Um, now I think I can employ what I was trying to get at by saying I'm quantitative and creative, which is like, I can employ my masculine and feminine energy in what I do, regardless of what it is. So I could be like solving math proofs and approaching it with both kind of like sides of myself, if we're going to like break it down that way. And I can do the same when I'm writing. And I think realizing that it's like not so binary it's actually never binary and if it's binary you're probably like missing something or like not integrating a part of yourself was a really freeing realization because I guess it it's sort of like it turns that notion of like I need to be this and this inwards and it's like okay what if like okay you want to be quantitative and creative like what are you really saying there it's like okay I want to be logical and I want to be like intuitive and then it's like okay well maybe you don't need to prove to the external world that you're logical and intuitive by doing two things that scream logic and intuition but you can actually just employ your logic and intuition in the one thing that you do so for me now it's like with writing I try at least to like bring rationality and logic into the way that I write and into the way that I explain concepts. And a big like interest area of mine is like how to make, you know, traditionally perceived like very spiritual or like woo concepts, logical and like rational and like make them make sense to people that think primarily in that way, because I definitely like to think that in that way and like definitely primarily thought in that way for a long time. And I understand, you know, the desire to understand but at the same time, I know that there are there are things that you kind of like need to let go of the idea of understanding every single step all the way in order to like imagine something that then you can like back channel and explain with um, 
like how you got there with rationality, but you kind of like need to just submit to the void sometimes. So like, I, that's how I kind of like see that duality manifesting in writing is if I'm trying to be rational and I'm like in my head and I'm very ego heavy while I'm writing, it will be bad. But if I can just like let myself flow through whatever is like channeling through me and whatever I'm thinking about and then try and like make it make more sense to an external eye afterwards, that's like a much more constructive process for me. So I guess all this to say, I don't think I need to do two separate things to use those two parts of myself anymore. I think when I integrate those two parts of myself, they manifest in the thing that I'm doing, whatever it is and however it's perceived, whether it's perceived as like a flowy artistic creative thing to the world or whether it's perceived as like a hardcore logic quantitative thing. Mm -hmm. I love I love that you spoke to how that manifests its now, itself now in your writing and uh, that's... Um... Yeah, that that's really interesting to hear about. So thank you. Um, what do you remember about when you started journaling and like why you started journaling and what that was like for you? Yeah. It's hard to go back to like why I started. I remember I'm looking at my journals across from me right now, which are like my journals from probably 10 years ago. Um, I think I was like kind of at the beginning of high school and really wanting to like document the experiences that I was going through. I don't know if I was like, this is going to be a formative time or if I just felt things were changing and like I wanted to make sense of them. But there was something very innate in me that understood that journaling was something that would or that does help me understand what's going on in my life. And I guess it's like kind of obvious, like that's the point of journaling. But I think for some reason, like a lot of people don't believe that it or see that it helps, like genuinely really helps on the day to day. So I guess I just understood that when I was younger. And like, as soon as I started doing it, I saw the benefits and like a huge benefit for me was, I think like at least for, and I'll generalize for a moment here, but like, I think for girls when you're younger like you you talk through a lot of stuff with your friends like you're all going through very similar things and you kind of talk through it a lot but I found there were some things that I like couldn't talk through with my friends like I don't know I was very deep and introspective from like a very young age so I felt like there were times where I was saying things that like people weren't clicking with um and I think that that's actually probably what compelled me to journaling like some level of being misunderstood or being like I'm on this different wavelength like I should really kind of explore this. And some of my very early entries in my like first journals were about like gratitude and like appreciating people. And like, I remember writing that it would be like the year of gratitude when I was in like ninth grade. And I was like, wow, I was really on that wave like early, um, early in my life, not early with respect to the world, but yeah, I think it was just like kind of things that like weren't being brought up in conversations with people at that age. So things that like couldn't be small talked about or like gossiped about or whatever. It was like me having those kind of like deep level introspective conversations um, with myself kind of young. So I think that's what got me into it. And then I just kind of kept going with it. Mm -hmm. What's your sense of how your journaling has changed over the years? Um, I would say that it has changed in the sense that I am a little bit more religious about it now. Um, I like do it every single day if I can. And I think that it's gotten much easier to get in flow state. And I'm usually processing a lot less because I'm doing it so consistently. So like, it's, it's rare that I have like, oh my gosh, I need to like sit down and you know, spend four hours with my journal kind of thing. It's just like when you're, when you have a practice that you're doing daily, when, whether it's anything like stretching, training, um, journaling, meditating, like the work, like the Delta of work you need to do every day to like feel centered becomes less after a certain amount of time. So I think that's why my writing was able actually to flourish so much after I created the space to focus on it fully it was like, I didn't have to do as much personal writing almost to like get to the, 
the core insights that I felt were going to be interesting or like perhaps helpful to other people. Or as before, I would have like a lot to process before I could tease out something that I was like, oh, maybe this will make sense to other people. Um, and yeah, I think just like consistency and anytime that, so the first year of my job, I actually didn't journal at all. I didn't write at all. And that was kind of like what catalyzed me reflecting on like, is this me trending in the direction I want to go in? Um, and it's just, I look back on that year and I almost like have less memories from it. Like I have, I feel like I was less centered, like less in my body and just, um, less like consciously opting into experiences that I was having I was kind of just like going with the flow like letting my environment shape me more whereas when I started journaling again like you just become so much aware or sorry I become a lot more aware of what I want out of like my life out of my day what my values are and I can like match my experiences much closer to like the life that I want. But if you're not thinking about the life that you want, it's very hard to reflect on whether you're getting it. Like you genuinely just don't have a model to compare it to, to compare your current reality to. So I think those are kind of some of the ways that like journaling matured with me. Hmm. And if we took like the average post from when you were, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18, and kind of put it side by side with a journal that you wrote you know, a week ago or two weeks ago, like, do you think there's anything you would notice about like the writing style or what you focused on or how you spoke or your voice or anything like that? It's funny because I think I would intuitively say yes, but I recently started like looking back through some of my journals and I was like, this is like a hundred percent my writing voice, like the <laughs> same. It's not obviously the exact same. Like my vernacular has changed and you know, the way that I write on the technical level has probably changed somewhat just intuitively, but the way that I wrote, was always actually like pretty consistent and I don't think I would have predicted that if I couldn't if I couldn't actually go back and re read what I was re writing then but yeah it's pretty like it's pretty humbling to realize like oh you actually had the juice like the whole time and it's really just a matter of like letting it flourish I was actually just reflecting on this um today how uh like I'm very I'm very very into this idea of manifesting our gifts is often just like a, a matter of reflecting back to like what captivated us as children what we were like as children what we gravitated to as children and just recapturing childlike wonder and like the sense of awe that you're kind of always in as a kid and I think our gifts and like our natural interests at that age if you had the opportunity to explore them are highly instructive and I was thinking about like if I was 10 years old and I was obsessed with writing, which I don't think I really was. I was always very observant and like curious and kind of like wise and like that, that kind of part of me always existed at a young age. And I was always very interested in older people, like getting their stories, but, and I was kind of into writing and I was good at English class, but again, I just didn't like really process that as something to pay attention to. But when I think about like, if I was into writing as a kid, as a 10 year old, everyone would be like, that's amazing. Like you should do that. Like, it's so great that you have this thing that you're into, like this is so awesome. But then it's like funny because I went on this kind of like winding path. That's like, that sort of like did like a little reverse parabola thing, like into like very high value, like high prestige industries where people, you know, think you're on like this great track. And then I could like somehow asymptoted my way, like back to just like writing and like doing my own thing. And now I think that confuses people a lot. They're like, wow, like you went from like venture capital and engineering to writing. Like, what's that like? Like, that's so odd. But I think, again, if I was a kid and I was doing it, nobody would find it odd. It's just like odd to do the things you liked as a kid, as an adult to people. It's genuinely odd because like nobody does that. Like everybody does their job, not everybody, but a lot of people that do their job and just kind of like, grind at it and like that's so so normal we don't question it at all we're not like oh does that interest you like does that excite you doesn't even like really get asked very much like after a certain age so I've just been kind of like laughing to myself a little bit about this that it's like so surprising and fascinating to people when you do the thing that called to you as a child or like something that maybe reminds them of childhood because it's just so not normalized when I think that that is like ultimately the path to like self-actualization and releasing your gifts in the world is tapping into like what you had as a kid so yeah I've just been reflecting on that a bit hmm. Hmm. what's your sense of almost 
like the causality of that or like why it would be the case that tapping into your gifts as a kid is what uh, helps you self-actualize? Well, I think that that's like when our natural script is most clear and that's almost like what we're trying to get back to when we are unlearning a lot of like what we were taught into adulthood, like how we have to be, how we have to, you know, act, like what's worth pursuing, what's not worth pursuing, what's valuable, what isn't, um, who we should respect, who we shouldn't, like what we should do, you know, like all of these things that you, I don't even know if you're just like consciously told them or you just like pick up on them through observing society, probably some combination of both, but you, through the process, you kind of erode that like, purity of childhood where you're just like interested in what you're interested in you think people are cool you talk to them you ask questions you're like always in curiosity always in awe and then at a certain point like things start to feel mundane and you just become focused on like status and prestige and like um you know your desires which are like mostly manifested by like looking at what other people desire and you literally like lose touch with this like gooey core of like what you're actually drawn to and I recognize that not everyone has something that they can 100% go back and connect with in childhood. Um, but I think like we all have the ability on some level to like connect with the feeling of being a child and the feeling of just, you know, like existing in that awe. And I think if you do try and connect with that, you realize like that's such a higher plane of existence that if you could massage your life into like allowing more of that come through in what you do and how you spend your time you probably would want to do that because it's just you become more alive like when I literally reflect on like the difference between me right now and like in this chapter where I'm able to focus on writing and I am like mostly in control of like where my energy goes and flows I actually just feel like this greater sense of aliveness like as if I've literally become more sentient, like that's actually how it feels. And I reflect on that and it's just crazy because I had no idea that before I was not getting access to whatever I'm getting access to now, but this feeling of just like expansive curiosity, awe, presence, it is so incredibly like unmatched by the feeling of like having to turn a huge part of yourself off to like do what you do. Um, and like turn your interests off to like make space for something that you like are obligated to do that I think like if people really really connected with that they might at least consider like taking steps to sort of like recapture that whether that's through their job or like in their free time and in their hobbies um, I just think like childhood holds so many of like the answers that we're looking for about how to enjoy and like find meaning in life mm. Mm. I love that I love that um com coming back to the journaling you said that your voice is kind of the same and like maybe the particulars or your vocabulary have changed or your writing skill but like the voice is very much the same and I'm curious how you would characterize your own voice as a writer I, I don't I exactly know how to characterize it because I do think it's it's kind of just how I think and how I speak mm-hmm I'd be curious your perspective because now you're hearing me speak a little bit more in conversation. You've read some of my writing, but I often will get messages from my friends who like, you know, have known me for decade plus, And they're just like, I could totally hear you read that article you just wrote, like in your voice. Like I just, mm -hmm. that was spoken to me in your voice. Um, and so I think that that tells me that I more or less like write how I speak and think, which I guess I don't really know how to describe. It's kind of hard to describe your own voice. When but you when you look back I, on your journal entries as a kid and you're like, oh, these are these are sort of the same. Like what is the sameness that you see? It's so funny. It's like I'm I'm I guess I'm what I'm trying to describe is like the voice inside my head because mm -hmm. that's what I see the same. Mm -hmm. Um it's kind of funny. It's like a little cheeky, like, you know, short sentences, long sentences, like a lot of varying of structure, a lot of like justifying to myself, my observations in the sense of like, oh, I observed this, but like, does this make sense? Like kind of having to like rationalize a lot, um, sort of like saying something that was like maybe a little out there, like to me and then being like, wait, but like, do I really believe that? Like, is that true? Like always trying to kind of check myself um, and like make it make sense. Which is funny because I think that that's 
like in a way like my gift or like what what helps my writing make sense to others is this need to like make it make sense to myself um it's interesting like I didn't really realize this was a skill until people said that they struggled with it but I think I'm actually just like very able to articulate the thoughts in my mind like there's not like when something occurs to me like I can put it into words like almost immediately like there's not a lot of lag there and I kind of just thought that that was the way everyone was like I genuinely didn't realize like I thought that that's what thoughts were like thoughts just merge in words you say them in words like it's it's not really um it's not like something like, I have to put a lot of processing power into but I've realized like that's actually like not intuitive to a lot of people and um I realized that I kind of trained that through writing like I trained that through writing for so long that when I felt like an interesting thought percolating I could just like look at it and then put it into words so um I think that that was that was kind of like one of the things that I would point to hmm. and if we if if I was like hanging out at your house and you were showing me one of your journal entries uh what would sort of the anatomy of a typical journal entry be for you like uh not so much the particular details but like I don't know how much time do you spend talking about specifics or like doing you know kind of analysis on your thinking process or like what's what's sort of the typical shape of a journal entry for you I would genuinely say there's no shape it's uh -huh. like free flow yeah it's like I'm not like this is what I'm talking about today three APE sentences five paragraph essay uh -huh. we're good uh -huh. they're just like I'm sitting in a coffee shop I'm looking at this like that's kind of what it is now because I like need to prompt myself to write um uh, most days unless there's something on my mind but like my old journal entries it was kind of like I'm like processing this big thing that happened like I just got to university I'm having this thing with a friend like I'm you know I'm feeling this right now I'm going through this like just literally writing what I was going through and what I was thinking about I think when I was younger I would mostly reach for my journal when I had something to like process whereas now I try and just do it and then realize that I actually always have something to process. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I do want to distinguish this from like, with respect to how I currently write and journal. I don't, I'm not like making things, I'm not like finding things to process in the sense of like, oh, I have nothing to process today. Let me like invent a problem for myself to think about. It's really about like noticing the subtle truths and like patterns in life and the things that just kind of get by you when you're like not in this state of paying attention. Um, and I think it's, it's kind of like a, such a privilege to be able to spend time like thinking about and processing that because I, I really do believe that like truth and lessons and themes in your life just like continue to repeat themselves like until you pick up on them and realize like either how you're handling them is not ideal or you're not realizing they're happening at all or some other you know, version of like how they're getting past you and then spending the time to like integrate and understand those things. You, you just become so much better at like doing your life because you're like ready for things when they happen, you recognize them when they happen and you just become more lucid to like the experiences you're having. So yeah, I just wanted to make that distinction. So it, it's not like this image of just like this cerebral mess of just trying to find problems in my life to process when it really is just like, how can I be a better agent of my own life and my own existence and perhaps help others see some of these things that might also be happening in their lives that are happening in mine. Hmm. Hmm. Do you have a, a particularly unusual journal entry that you remember that was like very experimental or totally different or like anything like that? Um... No, I don't. I would say like the thing that was kind of interesting and experimental was probably when I started sharing my thoughts mm -hmm. online, which again happened pretty young. Uh, I just like started a WordPress blog probably. Yeah. in like first or second year university, I think it was after first year. Um, and I just, I didn't even know exactly like what was going to make sense to other people, but I, I just started writing about like, habits well-being life choosing your career understanding yourself like understanding yourself that was kind of like always um 
the theme more or less. So I think the experiment was, and the interesting result from the experiment was realizing that my thoughts weren't that unique. Everyone was actually having very, not everyone, but like a lot of the people that were consuming my writing were having very similar thoughts to me. And that I had um, this apparently unique ability to articulate them and then like sort of massage them into this coherent, you know, set of words that other people's other people could consume and relate to and like really see themselves in. So I think that was like the kind of surprising, interesting experiment, which was realizing that these like personal experiences I was going through were actually like quite universal and quite um, present in a lot of people's lives, especially around my age group. So yeah, that's kind of what I would point to. Hmm. And what's your process like now as a writer? It's funny. I, I get this question a good amount, but I still don't really have a good answer for it because my process is literally just like existing and paying attention. Like that's like genuinely the process. Um, like I just really try to follow my curiosity and like full honesty. I read about the things that I'm interested in. I ask questions when I have a question. I spend time writing and processing what I'm learning. And I try and spend time with people who want to talk about similar things to what I'm interested in, but like perhaps share a different perspective. And I just kind of like synthesize these things that I'm absorbing and observing and learning and try and formulate them into <laughs> coherent boxes of text around theme, around a theme and, you know, try and like, yeah, I guess share a little bit more thought and depth into something that either we don't pay much attention to or we don't really look at in a certain way or just something that is like grabbing my attention at the moment. I think they generally like the theme generally tends to be around like thoughts, feelings, you know, introspection, psychology, but not like psychology in an academic sense, just like, why are we doing this? Or like, why have I noticed this pattern continuing to come up in my life? And like, what does it actually mean to embark on the process of individuation and like do something that we really enjoy or that lights us up like really trying to just almost like dissect these very common ideas or cliches that we've gotten so used to hearing over and over but like never really sinking into or spending time with um so that's one version of describing the process perhaps how long has it been now that you've been uh writing professionally um I think like seven or eight months. Okay. Is there anything you'd tell your past self of seven or eight months ago or a year ago about what this has been like? I would just say, do it, mm. like, do it. Like there's nothing, there's nothing but that. Uh -huh. um, and also like nothing I, I would say about what I've learned would even really matter because young Isabel needs to learn herself like mm. the visceral knowledge is the point like the embodied knowledge is the point and we can you know read all the books into oblivion but like until you do the thing that scares you and like learn the lessons it has to teach you you know mm. you haven't actually like gotten gotten what you're trying to get out of the thing that you're pursuing by like going through these sort of like different approaches to getting that knowledge like that is really my experience of it it's just people who have done something like this or people who I feel like are seeing what I'm seeing that I try and describe in my writing it's like we we kind of just connect over this like embodied experience of this knowledge or of whatever we're sharing and connecting over and it's very hard to just like put that in your brain through information consumption or even a conversation and advice and like really feeling it at the level that you feel it when you've learned through experience and like through taking the risks and like doing the things so I would just say like trust yourself and mm. do it mm. part of the reason I ask is I realized even yeah just earlier this week writing has always been part of my life and I've written so much and I already was planning to write more. Like last year I set the intention to always be writing at least one book at a time. Um, and I, you know, I have like various writing plans already in place. And then I, I realized that the last week I was like, I need to, 
write even more than I'm already writing or planning to write. And um, which is, for some reason, that surprised me as a realization, I guess, because it, it, it's already such a big part of my life, it, um, writing. And um, so part of the reason I ask is just like, yeah, like, what advice would you give someone else who is uh, starting out as a professional writer or something like that? I mean, you know, you're still seven or eight months in, but but that's actually a really juicy time. It's like, it's real right now. You're like making the choice to make this um, a significant you know, chapter of your life. And uh, yeah, like, what would you pass on to someone else? I would say don't force things and trust your curiosity. I think when you're starting out, it can be hard to really trust your voice and like that you have something interesting to say or that what you're interested in is interesting because you've only read people that aren't you and so you don't really realize that like maybe there's there are readers or people that are interested in your perspective or like the things that you seem to gravitate to and so you maybe start like trying to like either imitate a little bit or like be like oh this is to this this is to that this is not like not enough like this person that I like or or things that I've read um and I think over time you just start to like submit more to like how you actually want to write and how you actually want to express yourself and as you submit more to that like full embodied self-expression your writing gets better and people like it more because it's you and it's like unencumbered by ego and it's actually so pure and so interesting because again when you're writing or at least the kind of writing that I want to do it's like you're trying to get as close to thought as possible you're trying to get as close to the thing that the reader might have stumbled upon themselves or experienced themselves and the more you try and put that in like external polish and packaging the farther you get from the actual essence of the thing you're trying to express so the advice would be just trust yourself, trust how you want to express that and like do less almost to make it something you think it needs to be and sort of like relax into it and let it come through you in the way that it wants to come through you. Mm -hmm. Are there any writers that you've admired? Plenty. Mm -hmm. um, the writer that I spent the most time with growing up was Harlan Coben. He was an author of mystery novels and I just loved his voice. I loved his tone. It felt like all of his books, I'm staring at like a stack of them right now. Um, all of his books just kind of like felt like I was talking to an old friend. And I think that's when I really understood like what it meant to have a writing voice was like these little quirky, cheeky, like sarcastic, witty things that he would do that I could almost like predict after reading him enough. Um, so he really inspired me growing up. And then Ava's Substack was a huge inspiration for me. Ava, who's like book bear, um, she is super talented. And she was actually like the writer who I found when I was sort of like going through this phase of trying to figure out if I wanted to writing or, you know, basically just like figuring out what the true path forward was when um, I was starting to feel like I needed to, you know, reorient my life towards this like desired path. And yeah, she just like was really writing a lot of the stuff I was super interested in. Um, and I think like the, the little like bubble of Twitter that I'm in, like the current writers that are sort of up and coming, I'm very inspired by. Um, Nicole, like starting from Nick's Substack, Sherry, Schrodinger's Brad Substack, Kazra's, um, I think it's Kazra Tweets is his Twitter handle, Substack. And yeah, I just think that there's like this really interesting, cool movement of like emotions, thinking, intellect, intuition, and like all of this stuff sort of just meeting. And uh, yeah, it's just beautiful to watch. And I find it very inspiring. Hmm. Do you have any plans or hopes or ambitions as a writer? Like, do you, do you have any plans to write a book, for example? Um... I have been getting that question a good amount. I expect to write a book one day is how I would answer that question. Uh -huh. Yeah. 
that's kind of like where I stand on that question. Mm. Uh -huh. There's something about your voice saying that. And also earlier when you said, just do it uh, to your past self. Mm -hmm. I don't know what it is, but there's something very endearing about that quality. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're different tone of voices, but they're both they're both different than the speaking voice you've been using, answering a lot of the questions. I'm not sure what it is exactly. Yeah, yeah. I have uh, I was talking with a friend who's like very into IFS, like internal family systems. And we were talking about how like when we're speaking from different parts, I guess like high level on internal family systems is like this idea that you have um, like different parts of yourself that have like developed at different periods in your life. Like when you kind of like needed to be a certain way or do a certain thing to protect yourself or succeed or whatever. So then you end up like with all these little mini personalities that like come through into adulthood that are kind of like vestigial parts of childhood and you have to like reparent them and integrate them into yourself so you can like understand what's coming up and when it's coming up. But yeah, so we were, we were talking about how like different parts have different voices. So like when you, when you change your voice, your speaking voice changes, like you might be like speaking from a different part of yourself. Um, so perhaps huh. that's just like a different <laughs> different part. Uh, different parts. Yeah. Yeah, that seems likely. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, they say all parts are welcome and I like all your parts. So uh, <laughs> let's see. It's also, um, also interesting. Like I feel like when you're speaking from like ego or the mind where you're kind of like auditing what you're saying and you're sort of hesitating, you're correcting yourself and you're just kind of like not white in flow even if you're speaking like you know what's inside you it's a very different quality from like pure channeling like in the sense that you're like speaking from the heart you're not really like hesitating or pausing in your mind or refactoring what you're saying to like make it sound better or you know a certain way you're just really like channeling and I think that those qualities sound very different and if you're around artists especially and like people who are creative and spend a lot of time not in their head, like in, in the sense that they're trying to get to that sort of self-expression, you start to notice that contrast more, or at least like, this is my experience. And then you, you start to notice like when people are speaking from their mind more, but you are, if you are in an environment where people are mostly speaking from their mind and people mostly have to be like very conscious of what they're saying and like not step on anyone's toes and just be very political and like sort of diplomatic in the way they speak, then you get very, very little of like the heart centered pure channeling expression. So it's almost like you don't even realize that there's a contrast there. Hmm. Hmm. I'm chewing on a few things there. One, one is I just, I don't personally really like the word ego very much. Uh, and I've, hmm. you've used it multiple times in this conversation and, and also in your writing and, you know, plenty of people too, but that's my own personal beef. But, um, uh, but I do track the experience like of the word. what's that? Why don't you like the word ego? Why don't you like the word ego? It doesn't seem useful or kind. Um, the The distinction between mind and heart, speaking from your mind or your heart, that that seems like I can phenomenologically track that. But I don't know. The idea of ego seems to import a lot of like shame or judgment or um, just a specific model that I'm like, oh, is that real? Is that useful? Is that true? Is it kind? Um, it doesn't, and I think, I think maybe it's associated with like selfishness or something, which is also another concept I don't really like. I don't, I don't like the word selfishness. It's, it seems, um, morally judgmental in an unnecessary way to me. Um, at least a, a lot of colloquial uses of it seem to be like people think, oh, it's so selfish that I like care that I asked you for this thing that I want. And it's like, so, I would rather reserve that for something that's like actually morally corrupt in some way, uh, which most instances are not I, I, in my estimation. But um, that's that's my like fast read of what I feel about that. I feel like I could probably articulate that better if I thought about it some more. But yeah, I'm just curious like why the word ego itself is not kind to you. Well, it depends how someone uses it, but um, I don't think your uses of it were unkind necessarily, but um I, I i mean just practically i found like the distinction of oh i'm speaking for my mind or i'm speaking for my heart it's like oh that's that's useful it's not judgmental it's just like oh someone's in their head or like in their heart and, and really more about orienting toward your own phenomenology of it but um i don't know i must have seen it used in the past in ways that felt like prescriptive or like 
overly heavy or something like that and um uh yeah 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 it's just interesting because for me I feel like a big part of understanding like what I understand to be ego and my relationship to it is developing kindness for it and like appreciating it for what it's trying to do which is like to me my ego which is like the like the you know cluster of ideas that like make up who I am in my mind that tries to like reinforce that um through like how it instructs me to act in the world is like a protective force like it's trying to protect me and it's trying to like preserve me in the world and make it easier for me to like interact with society and to like you know be this thing that it, it perceives me to be and like I can appreciate that like I can appreciate what it's trying to do there are just times that like I don't need to be that person or need to be acting that way and so I've actually found like the most powerful state that I can be in with respect to my understanding of my ego is when I'm being kind to it and when I can speak to it and literally say like thank you for your service and like thank you for trying to protect me and like you know put me in the world in this you know presentable coherent way but I actually just don't need to be that right now and like I'm just going to be in my heart and I'm just going to be expressing in the way that I feel is okay and like when I have that conversation and like that acknowledgement of what it's trying to do for me it seems to be much more responsive and letting go of the resistance and I think that in the times where I've related to my ego in an unkind way it is from a place of frustration and anger like why is my ego doing this to me like why am I resisting this thing like why can't I just get over it like why am I scared you know like almost like frustrated with it like punishing it for you know holding me back from like whatever I think I you know expression actualization all these things but yeah like just that unkindness and like frustration with yourself or your mind or your ego or whatever you want to call it is not productive because it just like adds a layer of resistance onto the resistance from my experience and the most powerful thing to melt resistance away for me is the acknowledgement of like why the resistance is there and like why fear is there to protect me okay thank you but I'm I'm good like I promise I'm safe and then realizing like it's kind of a version I guess of IFS and like talking to those parts but I think the ego is kind of like this umbrella part of just protecting your identity and your sense of self and I think sometimes it's like having compassion for why that's there and like how genuinely evolved that is to be there is like part of the process with which I relate to my ego can you tell me a story about like a time that your ego flared up and what that was like for you? I, I can't think of like a very charged story, but I <laughs> think like I just experience it in the artistic process a lot where I feel myself coming up against my mind. Like I feel myself not wanting to say something or like go into a topic or just like struggling to get into flow state because um, I guess I'm like talking to myself in a way that's not conducive to being in full expression. Like, oh, that idea is not good enough or this isn't interesting or we don't have enough to write about or like whatever. Um, and I think finding a way to just like ne not ne kind of negotiate with my mind, but really just like soothe my mind. Like I feel like the negotiation is actually like soothing um, is what helps me like get into what I would describe as like my heart and like my ability to express through art, like and my art is like writing. Um, so I think like that's like, I guess not as specific in, I mean, of an example, but just the way in which I notice uh, my ego the most is just when it keeps me from like expressing in a way that's candid and natural and pure and true. There's a lot I've really appreciated about what you've said about this. And one of the things that it clarified for me is, I think part of the reason I have a little bit of an allergic reaction to it is just that I'm not, and this 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 sounds contradictory, but at least in my experience, I'm, I'm kind of like in flow a lot of the time or like in connection with my heart or like intuition or, you know, and I'm not, I'm not stopping what's happening from up here. Like I just, I just write or I just make art or I just ask questions or whatever it is, the thing that's to do 
in the given moment and uh don't and so so from that perspective of just like flowing through life uh it's like not a relatable experience uh in like everyday life but it's like oh i remember what that's like and it's not that i never get there or get stuck or something i definitely do but um if if it's it's a little bit um foreign from my usual experience these days yeah mm -hmm. yeah beautiful mm. well i liked hearing about that so thank you um You're welcome thank you for bringing up that um your like your relationship with the word ego i think that bridge a very interesting part of the conversation and by the way i'm sure that's like a super common feeling that people have and like mm -hmm. probably the way i felt before i kind of developed the view that i just described mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. definitely not that there's like a right or wrong way to relate to it just i think like what i've noticed is uh in conversation with people a lot especially people that like i think i'm generally aligned with when we disagree on something it's usually around the definition of a word like we actually <laughs> Which is like so bizarre because like you could be you you could be agreeing on something that you think you're agreeing on, but actually you don't agree because you don't define the word the same. Yeah. And obviously it goes for disagreement. And this happens all the time that like especially with these abstract concepts that aren't like clearly defined, ego being a perfect example of it. Mm. Um, you really start to see like the wrinkles in every everyone's understanding. Totally. Totally. Well, and that, yeah, that's, that's why I surface it because I, I'm very curious about how you see it. And I feel like I got to learn more about that. So it's, it's a real treat. Um, you know, cause usually when you read the word in print, you can't like argue with a word in print, but here you are. So, uh, yeah. Um, I asked earlier about like writers that you admire. I'm curious, I, you know, I've seen you write about other artists and other creators of, you know, who don't necessarily write and uh, like Kendrick Lamar, who I, I don't know very much about, if anything, really. And I wonder who are who are some of the artists that inspire you that aren't writers? And, and, and what I'm really interested in, like any kind of trends that you notice about the different artists that inspire you? Yeah, I would say rap is like a really good example of, I mean, they are writers, like they are kind of poets, mm -hmm. but um, I'm just no, revealing I... my ignorance here so you can educate me. <laughs> no, no, but like, I, I don't think like people would traditionally think of them as writers, like they're no. musicians and artists, but um, the the words that they use and the amount of like truth they're able to pack into such potent and like catchy and entertaining pieces of work of art is like so amazing to me. Um, so yeah, I do think like Kendrick and J. Cole who are both rap like rap artists are very inspiring to me i also like jid or jid who's another rap artist um and i think that i i guess like i specifically admire rap artists because they have so much like low-hanging fruit of like things that they could talk about that could just like rile up a crowd and like not be all that insightful and just kind of like you know, just beats and words that wouldn't necessarily like move someone's heart or insides, but like do the job of like the entertainment and the fun. But these artists really choose to like go the other way, which is that they like really focus on packing messages into their music and communicating through their music, like these deep beliefs and themes and lessons and reflections that they've had on their life and on life and I just think that that's so brave and impressive and artistic because you know if you're writing like the way I'm writing it's like you obviously have like I have this niche I guess of like I talk about emotions and feelings and truth and love and themes like and that's what people are coming to me for but like if you're Kendrick Lamar you have to entertain people, like get them going, get like a full crowd of like thousands and thousands of people going and you're dropping like truth and love and lessons on them. Like I just find that to be like peak art um, and so impressive. And just his recent album was like, I, I don't know, I've listened to it like too many times. Mm -hmm. It's just incredible. Like it's basically this sort of like long theatrical, almost like therapy process where he's processing his trauma kind of live on the album or like kind of recreates the moments where that happened 
And it's just so raw and like so humble and so honest and so powerful and also so enjoyable to listen to that it just is like pure mastery to me. And I, I just think like when you're at the top of a field, like you can do a lot of things and doing the thing of like creating a long form therapy trauma processing album that like it's very likely your audience might not resonate with and the level it's resonated with your previous art is like a pretty brave and kind of like somewhat heroic thing to do. So I think that that's like quite beautiful. And I think J. Cole's version of that was probably like For Your Eyes Only, his album that I think was like 2018-ish. Um, and also his most recent album. But like both of them just kind of going out of their way to communicate messages and themes that they believe in versus like what they think their audience wants. I think that's just that's amazing art and that's what you want like you want artists who stay true to themselves and it's just so hard to do when you're that big and you're that famous and there's that much noise and there's that much demands on you and pressure to be creating and like channeling such pure creations is like a very impressive feat to me hmm. you mentioned you know you've been talking about rap just now and uh earlier you talked about harlan coben i believe who's a mystery writer and I don't know, could you see yourself ever rapping or writing a mystery novel or is there any any like creative medium that you haven't explored yet that you could see yourself diving into in the future? Well, there's plenty of creative mediums I haven't explored yet that mm -hmm. I would love to dive into in the future. I think it's just like a matter of what I'm pulled to in the moment. I, I don't like categorize myself as musically inclined in general. Um but like I'm very open to experimenting with mediums as a form of play like I think we all have a notion of like what we're very good at and like can get really good at and those are the things we tend to like naturally gravitate to and be interested in um but I think like viewing yourself as medium agnostic and like viewing yourself as an artist independent of medium is a really important piece of like being an artist because it lets you expand your ability to express and like nurture your craft beyond the medium you're comfortable in and used to and like identify with. And I think that's just like a good exercise of identity itself because like, I don't want to identify as a writer, like solely as a writer to myself in my mind, because like, that's just such a limiting way to like perceive myself. Like I want to view myself as like an artist or a channel or just like this being that's just trying to express in whatever medium makes sense. And that's a lot of times writing, but yeah, I would love to experiment and I would love to like get involved in different mediums and take them more seriously because I think there's so much you can learn and bring back to your like kind of natural medium as well as just like for no utility at all, just for the sake of like expansion and creativity. Mm. Any in particular that you, I mean, I know you said it's in the moment, but are there any that you like, I think I'll try that sometime. Um, I'm kind of interested in like more physical mediums. Like, yeah, I've just always been very interested in like different forms of like movement and physical expression. And I find that like when you're writing, like that can be a pretty heady exercise. So something to get you into your body is like kind of wonderful I've always like liked yoga and just like movement of all kinds but I feel like dance could be interesting like aerial silks like something like very just like unusual for my body um I've also like been interested in martial arts like these kinds of things I don't have time to like or I don't have I guess like I'm not making it a priority is probably a better way to like really hone in on a different craft right now and there are certain crafts that I'm like if I do that like I want to have the time to be able to commit to you know the gradual improvement that is needed as a beginner um but yeah I, I am more interested in like physical expression and experimenting with that because I think at least right now that could have like the most benefits but hmm. again I'm open I'm also very interested in like language learning which I think has its own kind of like neuroplasticity benefits as well as just like being a great way to like use a totally different part of your brain if you're used to like writing in English all day mm -hmm. um but yeah physical physical stuff is good getting getting in your body is good mm -hmm. definitely uh do you I I could imagine you saying I don't even like to think about this this way uh but 
I like to think about it this way. So I'll ask you and feel free to be like, no, I don't think about it this way. But do you um, see any growth edges for yourself as a writer or things that you'd like to develop further in your skills as a writer? I would love to just like be more bold and output and like volume and just publishing. Like I think I publish like, you know, one in 10 things really that I like write. Mm. And I could probably like double or triple that on a short time horizon if I was just like, you know, get over yourself and do it kind of thing. But it's not even that like I finish a piece and I'm like, this isn't good. It's just that like that last 20% does take like the kind of like discipline part of the process that is not is good when I'm in it, but just like motivating myself to do it is not always the thing that I want to do. Like I think that kind of just like balance between divergence and convergence of ideas is something that I'm still like learning and finding the right balance of because yeah, it's just, I, I actually wrote about this in my piece, Find Novelty Through Commitment, which is that like, I feel the balance between optionality and commitment when I'm writing. Cause when I commit to writing an idea, I'm just like so happy that I committed to it and fleshed it out and finished it. But I also have like a very real desire to like write about more ideas and new ideas and like explore these different thoughts that are in my mind. I do think it's just like a time game at the end of the day. Like realistically, if you make the time to do both, you can do both. But yeah, just the balance between like polish and creation is something I think like I can, I could probably refine more just because I do have like ideas that I think would be great to get out that like have just kind of like you know lowered on the priority list or you know other things pop up and kind of cloud crowd them out so I think just like getting the engine of like publishing to be a little bit more oiled would be mm. probably good mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. what um motivated you to write about cool and coolness um I think I was just like noticing cool people a lot in my life like I think I was out one night and there was this girl that was just like literally a vibe like she was just like on the dance floor wearing this like super cool like retro sunglasses wearing this like you know just outfit that was very alternative and different and not like trying to show anything off like it was just very you could just tell she was being very her she had like big curly hair and was just dancing like super out there super crazy but like not to get attention at all like you could just tell it was her out there releasing having a night and I was like wow this girl's so cool and then I was like why is this girl so cool is because she doesn't care and like she's just full in expression and like everyone's just in awe and being like wow I kind of want to be like that girl but like the irony is she doesn't care <laughs> like mm -hmm. she doesn't care if you want to be like her or if you don't like her or if you're paying attention at all she's just literally not in her head doing her thing and she's not a scared she's not afraid to be herself and so I just kind of like started noticing this then I was like wait let me think about like all the people that I find cool and then I realized it was like all people that definitely don't care if I find them cool mm -hmm. and they're just people that are being themselves and doing their own thing. So yeah, then I was just realizing how much like when I was younger, like people optimized around like being cool and like having the cool things and the cool objects. And I feel like coolness is like the younger version of prestige, you know, like before everyone was chasing banking and consulting and like, you know, the best clubs and all these things, they were chasing like the like fancy sweatpants to get at that time in like grade seven or just like the like the cool items to have at school in that era or like silly bands or like whatever trend was in um and yeah and then I just realized like none of that is actually cool like the cool thing is like finding your own thing and doing it full out and then people are like oh that's cool because it looks cool on you because you are doing it from like a pure place instead of um just imitating uh and and you know like there's there's been some like interesting observations on my journey I would say where like when you do something very alternative people are like just very confused by it at first and there's like a lot of explaining and a lot of questions and then like when it starts to kind of like click for you for others for just like your world then people are kind of like have this like different angle of interest of almost like trying to tease out what you did and 
understand it from this lens of like, oh, this different thing is actually kind of cool. But it's just like this funny arc because whenever you're doing something different, initially people think it's weird and like confusing. And then eventually it becomes cool because like you stayed true to it and it's, you know, everyone just wants to stay true to themselves. Like fundamentally, that's what we admire. So I think that, that whole like tied back to coolness because I realized like what people are chasing is like being themselves, but nobody knows how to be themselves. So they just try and like imitate people that are being themselves and think that will get them closer, but it doesn't get them closer. It just gets them closer to having to imitate the next person. So I kind of just wanted to talk about this because I don't know. I just feel like the word cool gets that's thrown around so much. And like, we don't even think about it. Like, oh, that person is so cool. But like, why? Like, mm -hmm. why? Because they literally are not like you because they're just doing their own thing. And like, perhaps you're trying to be like someone else. So yeah, I just kind of felt very, very attached to the word itself. Hmm. What do you think is cool about yourself? Uh, I think I, I think I trust myself or at least I'm like getting closer to doing that well or better. And I think that's cool. Like I, I think self-trust is really cool and I find it very cool in others when they trust themselves. And it's really, it's quite hard, I would say, uh, especially when you're starting, <laughs> starting to focus on it more. Um, so intuition, self-trust, femininity, like just expression. I think these things are all cool. And I think there are things I both like actively and passively try to be more of. I think if you're like too consciously trying to be something, then, you know, that's like a whole different conversation about why you might be missing the mark, but just sort of like letting yourself be ends up allowing for a lot of the things that you find cool because admiration is just like us seeing our light in others. So you'll find yourself doing things that you admire if you just let yourself be and don't like force yourself into a box, but it like requires that allowing and like that surrender to self. So that's a practice that I'm working on find cool in others. When I see myself do it, I think it's cool, but I don't think about it like that. It's just, I feel like maybe a closer word is like, I feel satisfied or like, proud of or even like more confident in myself when I find myself trusting myself and I think like perhaps confidence and coolness are linked in the way that you externally appear cool when you are confident and you feel confident when you're trusting yourself so hmm. Hmm. you've been writing recently about uh enjoying spending time being alone and I wonder what that's qualitatively like for you to like really look forward to spending time with yourself and to enjoy it when you're by yourself I love alone time we all need to love alone time like alone time is fantastic you can do anything that you want and you can just enjoy it with no pressure no time constraints no need to do anything or be anywhere or be anyone like I don't know. I think like upon reflection, right. I was, I was talking about in my journey and like my story that a big theme was that I like to be busy. I don't think I ever consciously recognized that like maybe I was trading alone time for like busyness and stimulus, but I think there was an element of that. Like there was an element of avoiding myself by like doing the next impressive hard thing. And you know, that was part of my journey. And like, I accept all parts of my journey wouldn't change anything. But looking back, it's like, oh, I could have arrived at a lot of self-realizations earlier if I just like let myself sit with myself instead of thinking that busy equals good equals impressive equals succeeding, you know, like that I needed to be doing something all the time to be on the path. It's like so funny because of course that put me on the path. That was not the path that I had to like get off and find my way back to the path which involved a lot of alone time uh -huh. <laughs> um, so yeah there's probably a funny par paradox there but for me it's like if I don't have enough alone time I'm just like not as good of a person to myself to others and like I'm not as interesting or interested because I haven't had time to just like process like literally just like mentally you know consume the things that are like in my queue of cognitive bandwidth like if I was just like having a bunch of conversations this past week and I, I still feel this like lingering um, 
internal tension that like I haven't had enough alone time to like really absorb and process all of that and also it's like kind of slipping away because like now it's been a few days so I really feel now the difference in myself like in how I qualitatively feel when I've had time to process and when I feel like I'm just going to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and not getting time to like absorb and it's just such a wasteful to me it's a wasteful way of being to like be absorbing all these things that you don't have time to process because they basically just don't get stored so if you're not processing them it's almost like you didn't experience them or you didn't experience them fully because they can't be integrated into yourself so I've just like been learning this lesson I think um especially over the like this period that I've been writing because I spent a lot of time alone at the beginning to the point where I actually like came out of like my first four or five months of writing speaking differently to people because I realized like I had almost done like a full internal software update on my mind through writing so much and not having that much like social time or like extroverted time and then I was like I almost like didn't recognize the way I was speaking like it was just slightly different probably nobody else noticed but to me I noticed like I was using different words I was I was like I literally just like felt different and then I can go through times where I notice I'm like absorbing too much of my environment or the way that people are speaking to me or the people that I've been around. And I'm like, oh, that's not my speech. Like, that's not something I would say, or that's not words that I was saying before. This is like me just absorbing the memes around me and like, just kind of like being taken by my environment. So I think it's a balance. And like, when you have work that involves solitude writing, you obviously like have a lot of baseline alone time, but even beyond that I feel like I need like pre alone time post alone time to just like get into the state and to feel just like my life is in order like my inner world is in order so I don't know I think it's quite sad like to me that there are people that dread their own company it's just you know like this is all we have like this is our vessel and it's the one thing you're guaranteed to have for your whole life um maybe not in this form but like you kind of just like need to get comfortable in here because otherwise like you're going to be sitting in discomfort for your whole life like that just sounds like a horrible punishment so I do think alone time holds a lot of value and yeah I would I would recommend that people indulge in it if they have the ability to mm -hmm. do so and make time for it what's it like for you when you have this uh sense of really needing to catch up with yourself and that you've been spending too much time with other people and what's it like for you when that's more balanced than you like what does it feel like in your body or what kinds of thoughts tend to go through your head or behavior patterns come up or how do you think, notice that I think I have more control between stimulus and response when I spend time alone like something comes my way I can like take a moment be present respond when I'm like grounded and I think when I haven't had that time I'm just like more just like being kind of thrown around by my environment and like responding yes no like I just don't I don't have like this like quiet center to like draw upon um which knows the truth like that quiet center knows the answers to your question because that's just that's the resource with which you can trust yourself you know like you're when you're calm and you're grounded and you're centered you have the true signals coming up through you of like, do I want to see this person? Do I want to like go to this thing? Or do I, do I need some time? Or like, do I want to say yes, to this project, like whatever it is, like you just have more access to like your own inner truth, let's call it when um, you're, you're processed, you like have had that quiet time or that alone time to just center with yourself, or at least this is my experience. And I think uh, I just spent a lot of time in Mexico city and when I was there, I noticed that a lot of people use the word like practice, that everyone has a practice that they do to like stay grounded, whether that's yoga or writing or journaling or, you know, their craft of choice, meditation, whatever it is. And I started to like really love that word. I was just like, yeah, like everyone has this practice and they just like practice being grounded. Like, why is this so novel to me? And I realized like, that's what I think whatever the alone time is that you enjoy you being the royal you like anyone it's like that's your practice of like kind of dialing in um and 
you know, people will say like, I'm a completely different person if I don't go to the gym. And it's like, yes, part of it is just like going to the gym and getting the endorphins. But part of it is like the cognitive just unload that like happens when you're able to like be in your body, be alone, not respond to anyone, not be in your mind. It's a very like soothing and releasing process. So I think I just feel like more calm and like more aligned and like have more access to myself and like my kind of like deepest source of like inner truth and intuition and whatever your word of choice is for that um when I've had that time and kind of the opposite when I haven't Hmm. how would you describe to someone what that intuition or inner source of wisdom is I think it's like when your mind is quiet, what rises up from your body Mm -hmm. in your mind. Mm -hmm. You know, I had this realization recently that my wisdom, this thing that we're talking about, it rises from my body into my mind. It's rendered in my mind, but it's not generated in my mind. This was big because... I think we think our mind has all the answers because like, you know, it's talking all the time. It's like pumping us, like gives us the ability to like do math, solve problems, like, you know, do these very cerebral intellectual things. That's a totally different tool and task than what feels right to you. What feels right to you is a very somatic body feeling. And when you're, when your consciousness is like all in your head and not flush into your body at all it's much harder to figure out what feels right because like you're actually not feeling you're actually not feeling into your body at all so i think for me the access to the intuition or the inner wisdom or whatever we want to call it it's like what is my like what is my body telling me you know and sometimes it's just like a gut feeling where you're just like oh that feels like I shouldn't be here this person's giving me weird energy and it's like it can be that intangible and like somatic but sometimes it's like I'll literally just get like a phrase prop pop into my mind or like the answer to a question and you know it's funny because I think when I was younger like when people used to ask me for advice and when I was younger I just mean like you know late teenage years when like people are going through a lot of their own emotional coming of age stuff and like I would give advice and I would just be like you should do this you should tell them this you should whatever and now I'm like listen to your body like what does your body tell you you know and they're like I don't know and I'm like well you actually need to like sit with your feelings and let them talk to you and like speak to you and right now you're trying to like rationalize everything which is fine like you can you can do that but like at a certain point you need to kind of just wind down the mind and just like sit with yourself and if you really do that and develop that practice and nurture that practice you will start getting these like communications that come somatically through you in a much more reliable way like everyone knows the experience of having a strong gut feeling like I really felt like I should do this and then I didn't do it and I look back and I always know that I should have done that or like I really felt like I shouldn't do that and I didn't do it and thank god because this happened or whatever Like these crazy gut feeling stories that like make or break people's lives. You hear about them all the time. So like we've all kind of like, hopefully on some level felt a gut feeling, but you can actually find like subtler versions of that that are not like life propelling or life threatening if you train the muscle of listening. And this is self-trust. And I did write a piece about self-trust because I think that this is so like important, you know, because nobody can give you the answer to your questions that you have. And so- you know, that's how I would describe it. It's just like such a personal thing that is very hard to describe because it's not an intellectual thing. It's like a genuinely somatic and like inner world thing. But that's like the closest I can get is just what's the feelings you're having about this thing and how do those like translate into your mind, but being mindful that you're not just like spinning your minds in circles and then like spitting out answers that are like not at all charged with what your body said or feels. Hmm. This is, I love all of that. And it's clarifying something that I feel like is another gap that I have in a sense of your writing of like something I'm very curious to hear more about, which is like, 
do you have a story or an account that you tell yourself or that you sense or believe about who you are and why we're alive and what this world is? I think, sorry, I'm just having some water. I think we are here to serve and your gifts are your service and your gifts are those things that you like naturally gravitate to and feel the most alive when you do and you know get amazing feedback on when you do them and like people have always told you like you're so great at this or you just innately know like you just innately know I'm fire at this like I feel so good when I do it it comes easily to me I don't know what that is um but I think we all have like a form of service to do here and a really big breakthrough for me was realizing that it's actually selfish to keep your gifts in and to resist service because you're afraid of how your service is going to reflect on you or your gifts are going to reflect on you, the person. Like for me, it was just like the idea of being a writer. I was like, what the, like, I am not going to be a writer. Like mm -hmm. I studied engineering. I'm like in, like I've done all these like hard things to like do these, this important stuff. And like the idea of just being a writer, it's like, how could I do that? Like I am just discounting like all these, you know, selves that I built up in my head or like this identity I had wound up. But then I was like, but I'm so much better at doing this than like all these other things. And yes, I can do through, do them and muscle through them, but like, they don't feel good and I don't feel uniquely good at it. And I don't feel like I'm the only person that could do it. So if I believe in the idea that I am a person that can uniquely do something and everyone is a person that can uniquely do something, I should probably do the thing that I feel like I can uniquely do. Like, so I think that that's more or less the story. And like, when you ask me, you know, what are you working on and you're writing and this idea of like publishing more and just being more releasing, like having a, a weaker valve, I guess, on like what I let out is, is part of this because I think that is, you know, I'm in greater service when I'm like sharing more and I'm able to just like get over myself more. So I think that separating self from service has been kind of powerful and realizing that anytime I'm getting in my own way or getting in my own head, like it's kind of a disservice to like why I'm here. And it's not as though I should be at the end of this journey and it should be totally easy for me to just like release my gifts. Like I'm patient with the fact and compassionate with myself about the fact that this is like a lesson I'm learning and like something I'm growing into. But I do believe it. Like I do believe that purest existence is like pure service and not getting in your own head and getting in your own way about the things that are like meant to come through you. So that's kind of how I try and relax myself into the process when I'm feeling like a little tense or resistant to it. Hmm. How did you come to believe in this sense of service? Like what happened in your life that helped you orient towards that? I don't know exactly. Like, I think it's just been the compounding of like getting closer to something truth. Like I'm tempted to say truth, but mm. obviously that's such a vague answer. It's like, I don't know. The more layers I peel back, the more I just see this idea of like such reverence for people that have dedicated their lives to service to like service, like we think, you know, like healthcare or like teaching or like, you know, restaurants or like something we associate with the word service, like as if it's a very specific niched down profession. But like, I actually think just service is the way you serve, the way you show up for others, your presence, your being, your gifts, like it's just you, you know? And yeah, I just think like the more I've peeled back, the more I realize like we literally are just this like vehicle to, you know, interact with and like light up places and spaces and minds and beings and um I guess this is sounding quite spiritual and maybe that's because it is like it is a very spiritual thing it's it's a you know it's a very heart oriented thing it's not like I don't know and that's kind of before we started recording I mentioned how like I've been trying to get less in my head in the sense that like I don't like having very cerebral hyper intellectual conversations anymore even though that's something I used to love and crave and like equate with a good conversation but now I just realize like it's almost a distraction like it's almost a distraction from uh like I don't know the point like the point of existence which is just 
to like really be and to really like observe yourself and the moment and appreciate and just like be alive and let love fill you and come through you and receive and give and all these things like I I still believe in like a nice you know intellectual conversation every once in a while but I just think like when you can get too attached to thinking that why you're here is to just like solve these big questions or like do this very abstracted thing from humanity and maybe that is like some people's form of service like totally but I don't know. I think you kind of like miss the point sometimes when you get like a little too far away from reality and from like the experience of being. So I don't know if that answered the question of how I got there, but it's just been this like continual removal, I guess, of what I thought the story was or why we were here. And then I was like, oh yeah, it's just about, it's just about doing what you can do and like doing it best and doing your best and like doing what's true to you. And you honestly kind of know, like you kind of just know when you're doing what's true to you. And people ask me about my decision to write all the time. And I'm like, it's the best decision of my life. Like I'm so clearly on the path to me. Like it's so viscerally in my body that I'm doing the right thing. And it was so viscerally in my body that I was doing the wrong thing before that. I don't know exactly the destination or exactly the pace or whatever. Everyone wants to know those answers, but I know I'm on the right path because it's just a feeling. And so I think it's been like kind of experiential and also like seeing the responses to what you're doing like I think when you're serving you feel that you feel the way it's received like the messages I get are like truly blow my mind it's like I can't believe I'm resonating with people at the level that they describe I am and it's like almost puzzling because it feels again something so natural and like personal but innate to me and so when I realize the way that impacts others it's like oh I should definitely be doing this like not only does it feel right in my body to do it but it's clearly hitting like with people in the way that I would love for it to so uh yeah I think it's just like a combination of all these things Hmm. I love that as a kind of like peeling away of other stories and just realizing what's there I think uh yeah that's really helpful to see that that's how it's evolved for you yeah it's it's literally about like and I had just this is the last piece I wrote which um was called like becoming yourself is a process of reduction and the point Mm -hmm. was like it's actually about distilling and distilling and distilling the things that you're best at good at enjoy doing resonate with others the ways of being that are most aligned to you like I just look at people that are like so caught up in the materialist world that are like full like their life is just full of distractions from their you know center and I it 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 does like it 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 scares me a bit like it it disheartens me a bit it's just it feels it it feels like that person is very far from themselves and it's not like that's not me saying that out of judgment it's just the feeling that I get from them is like a not comfortable in themselves feeling and that's upsetting to me because I think like that's just the best feeling to feel comfortable with yourself. And this like connects the alone time thing. And that's why alone time is super helpful for this, but to always be like looking for the next thing and adding things and like needing more titles, accomplishments, objects, whatever is like the crutch that the thing we define ourselves with is Um, it just distracts from this process of reducing and reducing and reducing and getting closer to like the core of what we are. Mm. 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 I want to ask you a question that you asked other people, which is, uh, what would your life look like if you lived in full self-trust and may may already be there, but what does, what would, or what does that look like for you? I literally like had a vision about this, which is what prompted me, like fully just lying on a couch, closed my eyes, meditated and like full download had a vision of my life in full self-trust. And I was like, wow, it obviously wasn't like, this is your life in full self-trust production by like, but I just realized what I was seeing was my life in full self-trust. And actually more specifically, it was like my life without self-doubt, which I guess is the same, but like, that's what my initial realization was like, oh, if I didn't doubt myself, like this is what I was capable of. I think it would be like a very, very expansive and like crystallized version of what I'm doing on like a much larger scale. And just touching people like through different mediums, like very like kind of mixed between like in-person things, books, teaching, like just like a full expression of what I seem to have been blessed with, which is like some of these 
interests and like inclinations towards topics that seem to be quite universally helpful to people um, or at least people that are looking for them and finding ways to package them in ways that people can consume in an ideal way, integrate them. Um, it would just kind of be like what I'm doing at a much larger and more intensive scale. Like I, I think I'm on the right path, but I would love to just like touch as many people as I can with like what I believe to be my service mm. or like my, like the service that is in me or like what, whatever I have the capability to serve with. And um, yeah, I think it can actually like be very, very impactful if I fully trust myself. But I think like every single tiny micro step or like expansion of it feels like a confrontation with the self of like, am I really capable of this? Like, do I deserve to do this? Like, will people resonate with this? Is this even helpful? You know, literally doubt, like literally just self doubt. And if you kind of just like nod your head at those questions and you're like, yeah, you're right. Like, what's the point? You just like continue to stay where you are and like you stay on the level that you're existing. And I guess with this realization that like life is about service and like, I really do believe that I've, yeah, I've just started to see that through a different lens, like a, a more selfish lens of like, you're just, your self-doubt is costing like the people that you can serve. And I think employing that perspective is more helpful, but it's still a practice. Like it's not a silver bullet and trusting yourself and like reinforcing yourself. It, it's a complicated thing because it almost like feels egoic. Like it feels self-indulgent to think like I deserve to serve on this scale or like reach people in this way. But if you really do like in your body and in your truth, believe that, then it's a disservice not to. So I don't know. I, I do think like it's a complicated, it's complicated, but not. Hmm. Like, I feel like my relationship to humility and service is like, sort of, I'm still figuring it out. Like certain things that I used to think were humble, like I realize are actually self-absorbed and things that I thought were self-absorbed were actually like humble, like as I've gone deeper. So kind of ironing that out and readjusting my definitions mm. to bring it back to the definitions thing is its own process internally. Mm. Do you experience self-doubt these days? And what's that like for you when you do? Like I, I wouldn't describe myself as a person that experiences a lot of self-doubt, like on the on the basis of like my moment to moment level existence. But I think that when I'm tr like experimenting with the idea of doing something new or something that I don't perceive myself to be good at, which happens, you know, all the time, I certainly do experience self-doubt because mm -hmm. I think that that's like the experiment of being a beginner, you know, like you have to get over it. Like you have to just be like, of course I suck at this. Like I'm starting, you know? And I saw this really funny meme that I'll send you after, which is like, <laughs> like, just like this hilarious bit about, oh, you're judging yourself for like not being perfect at this thing you're trying for the first time. Like, take it easy, bro. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, it's so true. Like, why do we expect ourselves to be great at everything? And mostly things that we've never tried. So, you know, it's like this balance of like trying to be great at your craft for the sake of like, you know, ultimate service or like serving in the best way that you can. And then realizing like part of being in your craft is like being willing to do things you're bad at and like improving and building skills and areas of yourself that you've doubt in and not avoiding them like because avoidance is like the ultimate enemy you literally can't improve at something you're avoiding so uh, I think it's just sort of like teasing out these like specific feelings and like how you are getting in your way because you are all the time and you have to really pay attention to notice like it's so subtle it's so subtle the way we doubt ourselves because if you asked me this question like a, a little while ago I probably would be like no like yeah yeah of course a little bit but like not really but now I'm actually much more lucid to how much I do doubt myself and it's way more than I thought because I had almost just like gotten used to the fact that I had limiting beliefs and like didn't really recognize that they were that and now I realize like these are things that I can like actually untangle and like massage out but it takes the awareness that like they are limiting me and like doubt is limiting inherently hmm. 
Excellent. Hmm. That's really interesting. I lo- I feel like something I heard in that is that it's um uh conditional. It's like circumstantial. It's not just like whether it's there or not, but you're like, oh, am I trying something new or like pushing a comfort zone or something like that? And like that's when it tends to come up. And that makes a lot of sense of like um yeah, because over here, like talking to you and uh, listening to you, it's like, uh, yeah, I wouldn't characterize you either as someone who's in self-doubt a lot of the time. Like you seem very vibrant and like very clearly aligned with who you are and what you should be doing. And then, but also it's like, yeah, that's a phenomenon that uh, probably most of us, if not all of us experience. And it seems like something that's conditional and you might be, there's both like, how often are you in those circumstances? And like, how do you respond when those arise? Yeah, uh, that really clarified for me hearing you speak about that. Mm -hmm. Well, you have very patiently answered many of my questions. I wonder if there's anything else that you'd like to talk more about or dive into. Well, I guess one thing I'd like to add to the previous answer is like you said, oh, I might not like look at you and think like, oh, you're, you know, first of all, it's so interesting because genuinely we have no idea what's going on in anyone's inner world. And mm. like, we obviously know that, but it's just so crazy true. And you can kind of get the vibe of a person. And so you can maybe kind of get the vibe of what their inner world is like, but you still like, don't really know. And the other thing is that we all kind of have a very similar inner world, despite that, mm. like, in the sense that the universal things that we struggle with and question with are like so innately human, like truly that whatever you're going through, you can assume on some level, the person in front of you has probably gone through like a strain of that thing at one point, even if it's not right now. And then the last thing is that you do find what you look for. So I would say like there was just a period where I was not looking for self-doubt. So I didn't really notice it. Like I didn't really notice that element of my self-talk. And certainly it was still affecting me. It was still there. And like, that's what the whole thing is of making the unconscious conscious. But as I started to notice it and like catch it more and try and soothe it and correct it and just be mindful, even like sometimes not even addressing it, but just observing it. I became more lucid to that, that element of what was going on in my inner world. And then this also like extends to the external world. Like you do find what you look for. And I just, I can't emphasize enough how real this is like you find what you look for and you are always looking for something so if you're not consciously looking for something then you're unconsciously looking for something and finding it and that's the pattern that you keep seeing in your life of like why does this kind of thing keep happening to me or like why do I always end up in this state or like why do I keep like seeing this or coming up against people like this it's like there's an element of you And obviously this isn't to say like you're responsible for, it's your fault, everything that like happens in your life and you can control all of it. But there's like a a certain type of like impact that perspective and perception has because two people can go through the exact same things and have completely different experiences of it, would describe it to you in completely different ways, like process it in completely different ways. So it's just like an interesting idea to play with in our minds of like, what are we looking for? What are we seeing? Because like, that's on some level what we're looking for, like working backwards. Um, And I was just thinking about this because like I had a conversation recently with someone and, you know, it's like, there's always something that's not right, but it's like, of course there's always something that's not right because there could always be something that's not right. Like if you're looking for there always to be something that's not right, you can definitely 1000% find that in any moment of your life but you're if you're also looking for the idea that like this is a perfect moment you will find so many perfect moments like it's crazy just like a beautiful moment if you're looking for that you'll find plenty so it's just interesting to me because sometimes when I feel like I'm hearing someone complain about like the same thing or like observe the same thing in their life there's like a temptation to prompt like you know do you think like maybe you're also like seeking an element of that or like looking for this pattern to like repeat because I can point out like ways that if you reformulated like the way you were looking at this, it wouldn't appear that way. But like, there's no point in like me, you know, projecting what that image would look like for this person, but more so like kind of prompting them to notice, oh, I actually am creating my experience on some level. And like, I could actually recreate my experience if that's true. And how might I want to recreate my experience? Like, what experience do I want? 
And so these are just like interesting things to think about with respect to like, sure, like what's going on in our head, but also what do we feel is going on outside of it? Because I think that this just has a huge impact on like everything that it, it feels like is happening to us. And for me, oftentimes when I feel like I'm going through a phase where like some, like things aren't going right or like, you know, just like have somehow slipped into like a more negative perspective. If I just like notice what I'm looking for and like how I'm priming my mind in the day, then I'll see that there's a very close link between how I'm just like operating on like an experiential level and what I'm finding in my experience. Hmm. Sorry, how how does that relate to self-doubt and self-trust? Just that like for a while, I wasn't conscious of the self-doubt, mm. but it was still impacting me. Like there were still things I would like shy away from and like avoid because I was doubting myself, but I wasn't aware that it was self-doubt that was causing that. Mm. So then when I started to pay attention, like, oh, maybe I'm actually like getting in my way more than I think I am. I would notice like, oh yeah, there's this little like fear that pops up when I'm about to do that thing. And I, and then I move away from it. And that's why I don't do that thing. It's like the fear in my mind. It's not that I'm actually incapable or that these opportunities aren't coming up or whatever. It's like an actual psychic avoidance that's happening that if I'm not paying attention to, like I won't find. So you kind of need to like look for the ways as well that you're getting in your own way. If you feel like you're coming up against a wall and you like, don't know why. Sometimes it's just like this unconscious thing that's happening that you have to like look out for to notice. Hmm. Hmm. You said that people, we can't know what's happening for other people and, um, Hmm. I think, well, I, I'd be curious to know more about what you mean by that. And I think I like agree and don't agree. And um, on the one hand, you know, I've just met you. I've mostly read your writing. Um, you know, we've been talking for like two hours now. And so it's just like, yeah, I don't know a lot about you biographically. And like, we've just met and, uh, you know, I don't know what your internal experience from moment to moment is like necessarily. But um like when I said, I don't think you have a lot of self-doubt, like what did I mean by that is like, um, what, well, just in this conversation, for example, you know, I ask you, you have some kind of hard questions, like what's the universe? You know, that was a question I asked you, like, what are we doing here? Uh, and you're like, here, I'll tell you what I think. And uh, there's not um, a delay in response. You're like clear about what you think. And then, you know, you're you're publishing up a storm. I mean, you're writing so much and tweeting so much. And it's like, to me, that seems like a symptom of, uh, maybe not the absence of self-doubt. I that, That's not even a term I usually think in, but just that you're very much connected to like right. your life energy and what wants to come out of you. And um, right. that doesn't necessarily mean like the absence of blocks, but more of like skill and working with that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. um, that's, that's kind of what I see in you based on what I've been exposed to anyway. Mm -hmm. Well, I do think on some level, it is the absence of blocks, mm -hmm. actually. Because I think like when I reflect on any other time in my life, I had the same amount of life force and energy and wisdom or whatever, but I was just blocked, like mm -hmm. either blocking myself or blocked by not having enough time, which is, you know, blocking myself, not prioritizing it. But like psychologically, I was just blocking myself and being like, this isn't your true self and this isn't who you're going to present as. And like, this isn't Isabel at the mm -hmm. time myself. So I was totally just blocked myself and like I was blocked and then I did go through this process of unblocking and like my experience is that a clear mind lets the creativity flow through so like I try to tweet every day just as like a discipline of I will I will distill a thought every day I will distill an element of my daily experience every day and it's a good practice because there are days when I really don't feel like it and it's like the end of the day and I'm like getting in bed and I'm like, okay, what happened today? You know? And I realized that doing that like every day, it just like kind of melts away this like, like this, uh, this blindness almost to my experience, like having the rhythm of like every day I will, I will unblock something so that I can see it more clearly see it clearly enough to like put it in words and put it out into the world is this practice of like okay it is a practice that I have developed to unblock myself and sometimes I just wake up and it's like good and we're flowing and I don't need to do a lot and then there are some days where like that unblocking is a little bit more 
energy intensive maybe where I have to like prompt myself, get myself in the right environment and I'm resisting the environment and I have to change it. You know what I mean? Like there, there's still like a process sometimes, but um, if I were to say like the difference between me before I was writing online and like a, in a high volume way versus now it's like, yeah, I was just blocked. I was totally just psychologically blocked. And um, it's very interesting to reflect on that because it also just makes you think like how many people are there out there with like such amazing juice to share with the world, like truly just flooded with incredible insights, life force, art, perspectives, you know, contributions in whatever field. It doesn't need to just be like reflections and things. And they're just blocked by like their life and their choices or their norm that has like occurred or just fear. And yeah, it's just something I think about because I don't think my abilities are different than anyone. It's just that I think I try to stay unblocked and clear and circumstances are involved in that. But there's also just the element of like practicing, yeah, that awareness and like the noticing of, oh, I'm not seeing today or like, I don't feel clear today. Or like, why is there just like this psychic junk in my mind that's like not letting me see? Mm. 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 Is there any advice you'd give someone about unblocking? Like I I imagine some of it is like silence and alone time and writing and journaling, the things we've talked quite a bit about, but is there anything else that you'd add or uh, share about that? Yeah, there's a lot. Like I think this is part of a huge part of my work that I would Mm -hmm. love to do with people is just unblocking. Like it's complicated. It's like all things simple, but complicated kind of thing, like simple, not easy kind Mm -hmm. of thing. That's why it's complicated. Um, but it all traces back to fear. Like, what are you scared of? Like, what are you scared of being? Like, what are you scared that you are? You know, like what in you scares you that like Mm. might be true. You know, like the part of you that feels like you are this person that's so different than who you present from your life, who you present as in your life. Like that's, that's like disconnect of your identity and like your truth it's the ultimate block. And there's like a lot of other things too, like, yeah, fear, perception, judgment, like the, and other things like performance and perfectionism. These are all like kinds, kinds of blocks. But I think the fundamental one is like, how will my truth appear to the world? And it's a totally fair fear. It's a huge one, like the most valid, but I think the, like there is no choice but to like genuinely release and submit to putting out what scares you to get over it like the the conquering the fear through doing is truly the ultimate way and I still think there's some unblocking to do before you can even do and like to like notice the thing that's trying to get through you and to like feel comfortable expressing it takes its own work but the ultimate cure, like the ultimate antidote is to do the scary thing, realize, mm. oh, that was like a lot of psychological fear for something that actionably wasn't as fearful as I expected. And then just kind of like really trying to integrate that that noticing back into your life and to just like keep doing that, you know, like just keep doing, like this is ties back to the gymnastics thing. Like I think that's why I feel so blessed of having to gymnastics. Like you just need to whip yourself backwards on a beam and like hope for the best and like, that's scary, you know, and you're young and you're little and it hurts when you fall. But one thing our, our coach has always made us do, which is like actually a very valuable life lesson is when we would fall on a skill badly, like hurt, hurt yourself kind of fall, but not hurt yourself that you couldn't do another one. Just like, ouch. Now I don't really want to get back on the beam kind of ouch. Um, they would make us do like three more skills, three more versions of that skill landed before we like left the event or like moved on from our like that part of practice and that was so that we wouldn't be scared of it right because sometimes you like you do something you fall or you hurt yourself metaphorically speaking and then you're like oh that thing was bad like I'm never gonna do that again you know I'm never gonna ask a girl out again I'm never gonna like put my writing out again and because like it wasn't received well or whatever and then you associate the bad thing to the, the you know, good thing. And, um, then you stop doing it. But like, if you just keep going until you realize like the fear or the pain or like the fall was not 
coupled with that thing, but just like, was the effect of it one time or initially when you're learning? Cause of course we're not as good as th at things when we're learning, then it becomes much easier to keep doing the thing. Like once you've gotten that practice of proving to yourself, you can do it. So I try to think about that a lot, like the getting back on the beam and doing a few more before you move on. Like it's a good, it's a good hmm. thing to be tucked in there. Hmm. Was there a way that you were afraid the world would perceive you? Like, I don't know if at a specific level, like, I guess when I think I'm like, that's such now, definitely, but like reflecting back, it's such a like silly thing to think because the wor world's perceiving you anyway. And like, mm -hmm. it's going to have problems or like praises for you anyway. So to optimize for the world's perception is just like, I don't know. It's a, it's a pretty like lose, lose or win, win, or however you want to work with it. It doesn't, it doesn't necessarily like map to what you should do, but I do think I was a little bit like worried about i just felt like i had invested a lot in this identity that i had built like just a lot of time and effort and energy of i made a lot of sacrifices like i worked very hard and let myself be very stressed and just had a lot of sunk energy cost into becoming this person that i was and it was more like the fear of just letting go of all of that and just being like <laughs> like my my dad asked me the other day like what would like what would you say if I told you in like your first year of engineering that this is what you're going to be doing now and I was like I'd probably be like why am I going to do the next four years <laughs> because like it was so painful and I studied this like applied math stream which I literally chose because it was the most painful and hard one that I could detect and I didn't have a particular interest there's a theme here as we've noticed and so just su like suffering through some of that was for this like for this end goal of just like, I will become something that will use this and it will be worth it. And just trust in that, like having to unravel all of that sacrifice was like probably the work of just, it's okay though. Like it was part of the journey and like just telling myself, you know, like that was all part of developing the skill and getting to where you are. And like, honestly, my math training was great because logic training is great and logic helps with writing. And I, you know, there's lots of ways to craft the narrative to myself that it was all good and valuable. Um, but yeah, I think like I was a little bit intimidated by unraveling that whole identity. But if I really dig down, like it was more to myself than to the world. Hmm. What does that word unraveled mean to you? I mean, you you made that your handle and what does that yeah. mean to you? Uh, I guess it's just like the idea of pulling on the thread of a thought. I like that visual idea. And I think this whole idea of like distillation and getting to the core, it's all this unraveling. It's like the unraveling of the stories and the notions and the fears and the identity and all of the the things that are surrounding like the true core. And so I like the idea that like when I'm writing or when I'm exploring an idea, I'm like unraveling it to the center and trying to figure out like what's actually this thing. What is the core truth here? Um, and just trying to like distill it down. Um, and I like Twitter for that a lot because you're forced to like do short form. And sometimes all you need is short form. <laughs> like mm -hmm. sometimes you don't need to write a full essay. Um, and yeah, I think that's true a lot more than I I used to think. Like I think I've I've found a lot of empowerment in like the short form and realizing like how many of my ideas I can just literally get out very quickly if I just like unravel them get to the center and you know so it's kind of just like a combination of those things mm -hmm. your tweets are very powerful I mean I I like your essays that I've read and I think but I, I prefer your tweets to be honest uh I think really? they're, wow, they're very nice. punchy so I um I have to say they're all done in the moment. Like mm -hmm. I don't schedule them or draft them. It's just like brain to text to mm -hmm. Twitter. <laughs> like literally to me liking it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have a perfect pipeline, the two of us. That's right. That's right. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about? Um you know, nothing comes to mind. I guess I would just like generally say that. Some of the stuff that I've said here 
may resonate with you deeper than others. Some of the stuff you might be like, I don't understand what she's talking about at all. I have never had a realization like this. Or you might be like, oh, I've kind of like thought of that before. And I've had like a taste of that epiphany. And so I think it's just like, this is to the listener, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of being patient with your own journey of like realizing what feels true to you, like where you're at with your own introspection and self-exploration and you know reflections on life and also understanding that like when you are listening to people or reading people like some other stuff might resonate more than other stuff and like the stuff that does resonate is usually kind of like something you're subconsciously looking for thinking about and like to kind of double click on why that might have resonated or like what's interesting to you about that idea or what surprised you about this conversation because I think there's a lot of power in like what surprises us and what we find particularly interesting like this all just goes back to self-trust and truth and I think like the like literally to me um Chloe Cooper Jones had this line in her book which I love which is that beauty is a feeling of high attention and I think to me that's also very similar to the texture of curiosity curiosity is like like the sort of like openness and like attention directed at something. And so I think kind of as you listen to this conversation and other conversations in your life and just in your existence in general, like noticing that feeling of like, oh, I feel particularly open by something this person said, or that felt like a moment of high attention for me. Um, yeah, just like looking at those and finding the patterns and the ideas that are particularly calling to you at this moment in time. Mm. Mm, I love that. Yeah, thanks for adding that. And thank you as well for joining me and speaking with me and sharing so much of your heart and your wisdom. I really appreciate it, friend. Thank you so much for having me. This was such a lovely conversation. I really appreciate it and your questions and you're such a great listener and I see you. Mm, thanks, friend.